Ready, Dave? Good morning. Welcome to Christ Our King Lutheran Church in Saline, Michigan. We're happy to have you here to worship with us. We have a few pre-service songs to sing, and we'd love to have you join us. Our first song is Grace Alone.
How wide?
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, tomorrow. You got your Valentine's all cards all figured out? I do not. Pick so, those little candies out with those words on them? Right. I'm uh, in the process of writing on some of those candies now. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, we pray that, uh, uh, that you have an excellent Valentine's weekend, especially to celebrate God sending his uh, Valentine to us. We have uh, praise team is leading us again. This yeah, it's week. great to have them back. And uh, we have some announcements to uh, be brought to our attention. We would like to start here. Please, Deanna. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have like three announcements uh, to make. So tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Um, and I am doing a story time at 2 o'clock on Zoom. And uh, Victoria is going to put it in the email, the link. Um, and it's basically a story about God's love. Um, it's a children's book. But anybody from any age is welcome to join us for that. Um, and then. Um, I signed our church up for Easter baskets. Celine Social Services is doing Easter baskets this year, and they are actually asking for some food um, to put in these baskets. We didn't get to do that for Thanksgiving. We didn't get to do that for Christmas, but um, this time they are actually asking that we can go and purchase some things. Um, there have over 100 families that they are helping. And so I signed our church up for 20 of those baskets. Um, there will be a list that will be in next week's bulletin. And also it will be um, on the weekly email that comes out on Monday, uh, a list of things. So it's basically, we need to supply the baskets. But there's gonna be a lot of things um, in that basket. Uh, so I'm thinking large laundry baskets or um, totes, large totes, um, to put the items in. Um, so we'll need 20 of those, and uh, then I, there's all kinds of food that will be listed there for, for you to see. Um, and they actually asked for Easter stuff, too. So like Easter grass and the peeps or whatever, so you know we can, we can give those type of things for them. Um, and then I am working on kind of like Journey to the Cross, um, but it, Journey of the Cross is supposed to be interactive. Um, but this is going to be more like video sections. So I'm looking for people that would like to help with the videos. Um, uh, you'll get a script. We'll have costumes. Um, and I'd like to do that, the, vi um, the taping in the early March. And so it's ready for p the Passion Week. Um, basically, I'm looking to have each day of the Passion Week, starting with Palm Sunday to e ending with Easter, um, that there would be a video every day that somebody that you could go on and you can watch um, to help you with the uh, getting ready for Easter um, and what God and what Jesus went through during those times. So, if you're interested, come and see me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Deanna, for all those things that you've got going on. That's exciting. <laughs> Looks like Larry E. Swisher is coming up. What does the E stand for? Elwood? Elwood. Elwood. Larry E. Swisher stands, L-E-S means less, right? Yes. Less is more, huh? I don't know about that. Anyway, uh, just an update on our, from the call committee for the call that we're doing for a senior pastor. And you know, at our voters meeting, on February the 7th, for calling a senior pastor, one was selected, and that pastor was notified that Sunday. Information has been sent to the pastor, and it was confirmed that he did receive the information. So on February the 11th, the call documents were sent to the pastor, and he should have gotten them on the same day. So... Steve is going to reach out 
to the pastor this weekend sometime to see how things were going and making sure that he got everything. So please keep him, his family, and his churches in our prayers. He has not been informed. He has not informed his churches yet. So continue to keep information about the call in strict confidence. And thank you again for doing this. Thanks, Larry. Pastor Don, any other announcements from the back? Wherever you are, he's back there. I don't think so. We focus our hearts and minds on worship with the singing of our opening hymn. invite you to stand. We begin our worship this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gracious God has not left us alone in our fallen state. Jesus entered human history to die for our sins and rise again, bound for heaven to be at the right hand of God the Father. Therefore, in repentant joy and faith-filled confidence, we go to the throne of God's grace, confessing our sins. Heavenly Father, we confess that we would prefer to ascend to the heavens like Elijah, but without acknowledging our sin. Forgive us, good Lord. We confess that we have let the troubles of this world cloud our vision of Christ's innocence and blessedness. Forgive us, good Lord. We confess that we have not let your gospel promises 
permeate our thinking and our living. Forgive us, dear Lord. In worship, your word comes to us revealing Jesus. Yet we leave this mountaintop revelation, willing to forget and dismiss the importance of your word for daily living. Forgive us, dear Lord. Our hope for daily and eternal forgiveness is secure in Jesus. For he who was transfigured is the one who died on the cross and was raised on the third day. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God who said, let your light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As Jesus entered human history to call us out of this dark world, so let us now boldly enter into his presence with rejoicing. In the, In the name, name of Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. And let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in His glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we carefully listen to God's Word. Good morning. Good morning. The Old Testament lesson for this morning comes from the second book of Kings, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed... Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
The epistle lesson for today comes from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And rejoicing, he is moving, he 
for our Savior, we stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel lesson. Holy Gospel lesson for this Sunday of the Transfiguration is according to St. Mark's Gospel, the ninth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you O Lord. Lord. We begin reading with the second verse. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And he appeared before them. There appeared Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. You may be seated for our message hymn.
grace indeed, by grace alone, we have our eternal life in Christ Jesus. Him we celebrate. Our text for this morning is taken from the epistle lesson read a few moments ago. I invite you to join me in reading from the text. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Pastor Tom, I uh, need your help. Uh, do you uh, tell us about transformers, if you would? Transformers, I think, uh, if I remember right, uh, my son had uh, some of those toys uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, do you have your mic on there, please? I think I don't. You Thanks don't? for reminding okay, me. Right, okay. So you, you were saying that, now, when you and I grew up, uh, back in the... Uh, last millennia. Bart, back when the Dead Sea was still sick. Just sick, right. Yeah. A transformer was a... Oh, a train transformer, you know. You uh, hooked the wires up and it transformed the electrical current down into the train. Right. That, pretty complicated. It was very complicated. Uh, you work for DTE. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but at any rate, but now you're talking about a transformer uh, like you're... Uh, like a toy. Like a toy, right. So I brought along a transformer because today is Transformation Sunday, Transfiguration Sunday, and it's all about transformation. Now this is a transformer, uh, so a transformer will change, correct? Yep. Okay. Transform. Try that again. Okay. Let's all join together. Transform. Transform. Well, don't you know, have you never played with a Transformer toy? I'm afraid that I... Well, you have to actually do something. I think there's probably a button here or something, someplace, maybe back here where the tailpipe is. Oh, okay. There, there you go. go. Hey, it works. So you, you have to push that little button in the back, and it changes, transform, changes. Oh, so it can't transform itself? No, and then if you want to put it back, you have to push this down, I think, like okay. that. But the, even though it's supposed to be a transformer, it can't transform itself. Someone has to transform it. Somebody has to transform it. You know, and that kind of reminds me, you know, as you're sitting here talking about this, it's interesting. Did you plan this out? It's interesting that you have this on the baptismal font, and my estimation is that's where your initial transformation took place, the hmm. ultimate transformation in your life. You want to explain that? You're doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was my As God sermon, the Father gotta... <laughs> did for you. God the Father in the waters of baptism did for you what you could not do for yourself. He brought you in a, into a connection with his son's death and resurrection. He washed away your sin. He gave you eternal life. A lot of people get baptism all messed up, don't they? They certainly they do. They think it's something they do to get right with God, but it's God acting on our behalf. And it's kind of like the old Transformers, too. How's that? The tremendous power of God is oh, transformed yeah. down into us in there a way that we can receive it yep. and truly transforms us into a very, very powerful I think you should life. try that button back there. It's back no, there by know. the exhaust pipe. Why don't you try it? I don't know here. There oh, you go. Hey, all hey, right. It all right. It works. Speaking of being transformed by holy baptism, we have somebody who's uh, celebrating a baptismal 60 anniversary. years on 60. February 14th, 1960, Tom Wright was baptized into the Christian faith. Congratulations. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Well, Pastor Tom, thank you very much. Now, if you don't mind, can I have my sermon back? <laughs> <laughs> oh, people of God, people whose faith is in the transfigurated Christ Jesus, the one who continues to try to transport us into greater living. I don't know about you, uh, but I don't think I'd want to be in this man's shoes 
or in his car either. Uh, earlier we were talking about driving a school bus, and uh, how many times have you been stuck like this? Yeah. Often, right, okay, unusual. But I don't think, uh, fewer things are kind of uh, more disturbing are not very pleasant at all when you have to drive down a muddy country road and a car lurches back and forth uh, in the ruts and finally getting stuck uh, in the mud. Now, unfortunately, it's not just country roads that have ruts. Uh, it's easy for us to find ourselves, uh, our lives, uh, stuck in ruts in the ways that we live. And it's not just the routines of life. Routines can be very good. Routines in life can, schedules can help us to accomplish things that God wants us to do. But the real ruts in life uh, are our attitudes, uh, are our perspectives, uh, the way that we look at life, uh, the priorities that we set for ourselves, or that we allow other people in the world to set for us. And especially the self-centered ways uh, that we often live. Those are the kind of ruts uh, that really get us bogged down and stuck uh, in living. It's kind of like a man said that uh, I go to bed exhausted. I get up in the morning. I'm already weary as I look ahead to the day. I go through the motions at work. I eat. I watch TV. I check Facebook. I wait for the weekend that only exhausts me even more than a work week. I go around and around in the same old ruts and keep getting deeper and deeper. But the worst thing of all is, I don't even know why I'm doing it. I don't even know why I'm doing it. Now that's being stuck. Stuck in the mud, the mire, the ruts of life. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we realize that God is in the business of transforming lives. God's in the business of transforming lives. God is the one who wants to reach down to us and pull us up out of the mud and into His glory. Our mission statement here at Christ our King states God's desire uh, to transform everybody into devoted followers of, uh, of Christ Jesus. I, I'm, uh, so we, as you read through those, that uh, statement, look again at what is emphasizing of what the goal and the purpose uh, of our ministry here at Christ our King is. Thank you for putting it back up, Thomas. Let's read this together. Activated, Activated by, by the, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, we will glorify God, God through, through His, His Word, Word, our worship, worship His, His works, works, and, and our witness. witness. So, so that, that all people, people can be transformed, transformed into, into devoted, devoted followers of, of Jesus Christ. Christ. So this is what God is all about. And this is what we as a congregation are is about. And uh, that we understand that this is what God wants. This is God's will. That people are devoted followers of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now what these words are also saying is, every time we come to church... Every time we open a Bible, every time we pray, every time we're involved in fellowship, uh, we are doing that so that God will change us, so that God will transform us. In other words, we're admitting we need transformation. So how does God go about transforming us? Uh, in the text, it's very, very clear. It says, first thing that he does is he removes the blindfolds. He removes the blindfolds. Uh, St. Paul tells us that the God of this age is in the business of blinding our minds. Blinding our minds. Do you notice a radical difference? God's in the business of transforming us. Satan is in the business of blinding our minds. And so St. Paul, the picture that he gives us here uh, through the Holy Spirit is... Satan gets into our heads. He gets into our heads uh, so that uh, uh, he will keep us from understanding what is true, what is reliable, keeping us from seeing uh, the gospel that God makes available to us. And St. Paul also writes, 
about a, a veil that has been put over the eyes of people. A veil that has been put over the eyes of people. So, one of the ways that we can think of having blindfolds is uh, to think, uh, you know, I really don't need to change. I really don't need to change. I'm doing pretty well with my life. After all, this is my life. Uh, I've got things outlined the way that I want to live it. I'm going to live it the way uh, that I want to live it. I'm going to decide what is best for me. I want to decide what is best for me. Now, one thing about that kind of blindness, it doesn't keep us in the ruts. It pours life down the drain. It pours life down the drain. Self-centered living always results in the loss of life because our self is sinful. The core of our being is always contaminated with the power of sin. It is always having us lean away from God and His love and His mercy. And as it has us lean away from God and His mercy, it's also separating us from the life that only He can give. Our natural bland, blinded tendencies take us away from God. And they wind up dry, draining life from us. There is absolutely no mistake when we look at the Scriptures a life that is driven by the power of sin within me always goes down the tubes. It always goes down the tubes. God is the one, the only one, who can lift us up. And so Satan, the God of this world, blinds us into thinking that life is all about me and what I want. Now, another way that we have veils over our minds, uh, as St. Paul writes about it, as God the Holy Spirit has St. Paul write about it, uh, one of the ways we have veils over our minds is when we read the Bible as a to-do list. As a to-do list. Uh, it's always tempting to read the Scriptures uh, just to find out what is it that I'm supposed to do. What is it that I'm supposed to do? What law must I follow? What commandment will I have to go through? What regulation do I need to do? And if I just do this particular list of to-do things, then I'm going to lift myself up to God. Then I'm going to lift myself up to the glory of God. Now, unfortunately, there are many groups among Christians today who approach the Bible that way. That the Bible is nothing more than a to-do list. Uh, the religions of this world, uh, as Pastor Tom told us last week, all the religions of this world are nothing more than to-do lists uh, that are given so that people try to accomplish uh, the glory of God uh, by their own works and their own efforts. And it doesn't work. It simply does not work. The Scripture is not designed to be a to-do list for us of things that we are to do. Now, definitely it gives direction for life, yes. But the primary purpose of the, of the Scriptures is to make a list for us to review over and over again. And what are those lists about? Those lists are about what God has done. Those lists are about what God is doing. Those lists are about what God promises that He is going to do. And that He assures us that He will indeed do these things. And so, the emphasis in the Scripture is always, what is it that God is doing for us? How is He filling us with His glory so that lives, my life can be changed? As we read through the Scriptures, we see people one after another of people who were transformed, people who were changed. And how were those lives changed? Only after the compassion of God came into them. Only when their minds had really gotten soaked through and through with the great glory and the majesty and the love and the forgiveness of God. 
And so people like Abraham, Moses, Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, St. Paul, countless others as we go through the scriptures were transformed. All by the grace, the mercy of God. When we read the scriptures as a to-do list, it always winds up putting blindfolds back on our lives. It always puts blindfolds back on our lives. Instead of rejoicing in the wondrous love that God has for us, our minds are directed back to me and what I have to do and what I need to do. And the results is, are, you know, if I just work harder, if I just work smarter, uh, then I can change my life. Then I can make it into something that is really, really something. But when we're stuck, the temptation is always to just pour on the gas. And what happens? What happens when we're stuck and we just pour on the gas? We get even more stuck. Spin your wheels. You don't get anywhere. You waste all kinds of energy, all kinds of effort, and you still stay stuck. Like this guy, we need somebody or something to pull us out of the mud and the mire. Real change happens only by the transforming power of God in Christ Jesus. Transformation will not take place till we realize and admit that God is the one, the only one, who has the power to make our lives into real living. It's like that Transformers toy in a children's message. It doesn't change on its own. It needs help. And the blindfolds that cover our minds have to be removed so that the transforming power of Christ might enter us. So the blinds need to be removed. The veil's taken away. And then the next step for transformation is exposure to the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the very image of the invisible God. God, the Holy Spirit, in St. Paul epistle lesson that was read, that John read a few moments ago, it can't get clearer than that. Jesus is God in the flesh. Almighty God in the flesh. The perfect image of God in this world. You cannot get a better understanding of God than what we find in Christ Jesus. Simply cannot do it. Jesus is the most vivid demonstration of God that we will ever have in this world. Jesus is the heart of God. Now last week, Pastor Tom reminded us also that uh, God indeed sent us a valentine. But it wasn't a box of chocolates. And it wasn't a card, even though you're not even a Hallmark card. And it wasn't a bunch of flowers. God sent us his very best, his son. Jesus is a full expression the valentine that demonstrates God's love for us. That God loves us so completely, so completely, that he gave himself completely and totally as a sacrifice for us. That he paid the penalty of our sins. It is by his forgiveness that God lifts us up out of a life that goes down the drains. And he lifts us up into a life that is transformed by God's glory. Jesus is the perfect mirror of God. Jesus is the perfect mirror of God's great love and mercy and his desires for us. In Jesus, we come face to face with God. There's no greater mentor that we could ever have, that we want, could ever imitate. A teenage boy had always been respectful and helpful, uh, but he started running around with a new group of friends, and uh, his attitude uh, and his words and his actions uh, changed for the worse. He became very disrespectful. He refused to cooperate. And finally, his parents said to him one day, said, what have you done to our, where, where, what have you done with our son? What have you done with our son? 
Uh, you don't appear, you don't give the appearance of our son at all. Uh, what you're doing, you're giving us the appearance of your disrespectful friends. If you're going to imitate somebody, you better get a new set of friends. You better get a new set of friends. So who are we imitating? Do we need a new group of friends? In Christ, we come face to face with God, seeing his great love, his mercy, his forgiveness. Jesus gives this image of God so that we become more and more like him, loving, forgiving, and understanding of others. In other words, so that we might be transformed. Now, transform then needs removal of blindfolds. It needs looking to the glory of God. And a third thing that is very, very helpful is we pray that God would give us opportunities to be more and more like Him. There was a young man named Joel who lived in a very crowded part of a large city. There was a small park that was near his apartment. And on Saturday afternoons, he quite often would uh, take a walk in the park when the weather was good. And as he would walk around the park, he noticed there were a lot of kids from the neighborhood playing in the park, but actually they were just mostly wandering around aimlessly uh, with nothing really to do. And so uh, Joel began to um, bring a backpack uh, with him as he went to the park on Saturday afternoons, and he had that backpack filled with all kinds of things. And he would sit down in the grass, take some objects out of the backpack, uh, not saying a word to anybody else. And uh, kids started noticing uh, what he was pulling out of the backpack. And pretty soon he was surrounded by children. And uh, he would talk to them about some of the objects that he had brought. He had talked to them about God's marvelous creation. Uh, he brought... Uh, uh, leaflets, uh, Sunday school leaflets from his church, and he handed them out to the, stu to the children there, and he talked to them about Jesus and God's great love uh, for them. And what happened was, no longer were children just walking aimlessly through the park. Uh, now they were gathering around, around Joel. They were with friends. They were laughing together. They were learning about Jesus and the great love that God has for each of them. And one afternoon, several children were playing on a school playground, and as they were playing, they were arguing about what Jesus looked like. And one of the children said, we don't know what Jesus looked like. There ain't no picture of Jesus. And another child said, oh, yes, there is. Jesus looks just like Joel. Jesus looks just like Joel. You see, that's the privilege that God gives to us, to have his light shining in us, through us, upon us, so that we might mirror his glory, so that others might see Christ in us as we mirror and reflect his glory. It might not be with children in a park, and perhaps it's a way that we treat fellow workers, or family members, or people in a checkout line, or even the person we're talking with on the phone when we are discussing a problem that we have with one of their products. See, God gives us opportunities so that His glory might shine through us. When Jesus was transfigured on the mountaintop in Galilee, three of His disciples were able to see Him in all of His glory, to see that He definitely is God. But actually, they'd already been seeing that in everything that Jesus had been doing and teaching before. They saw it in his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, his compassion, were continually being demonstrated the powerful presence of God within him. The transfiguration was just another way of showing it in even more brilliant form. But you see, it is God who in his great mercy reaches down into the mud to pull us up into His glory. God in His great mercy and His love is transforming us to live more and more like Him. And as He does that, He pulls us out of ruts of life and fills us with His glory 
and his purpose. He does for us what we can never do for ourselves. And so people of God, people whose faith is in the glorious Christ Jesus. What image are we, are we reflecting? Whenever we look into a mirror, may we pray. God, fill me with your transforming glory. Fill me with your love, your forgiveness, so that in me Christ might be shown as vividly as possible. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen indeed. What are we doing next? A creed, of course. We rise and we join in declaring our faith and confidence in God, our Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and, and in Jesus Christ, Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You know, the thought occurs to me that uh, the account of the transfiguration is found in all four of the Gospels, but some people would say, well, where's it found in the Gospel of John? It's only found in one place, John chapter 1, verse 14, where John says this, We beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and mercy and truth. In our prayers today, we want to remember uh, Tom Wright's son, Robbie, as he continues to deal with uh, uh, medical challenges, maybe neurological, pray for health and healing for him, as well as also in our prayers, besides the ones in our worship, uh, our prayer connector, we want to remember uh, Janet Thompson's uh, brother uh, and also Bob Schrock's cousin, who was called to his heavenly home this last week, I believe, he lives in Wisconsin. And we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Let us pray that Jesus would remain with those for whom we pray, ruling their hearts and their minds that by faith they may understand his will for them. For all who do not know Christ, that God would send people of faith to them with the good news of salvation. And for those whose faith is weak, that the Holy Spirit would use the Holy Scriptures and the sacrament to strengthen them. Let us pray to the Lord. Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your, your name. name. Your, your kingdom come. come. For all who suffer injustice and persecution, that the Lord of the nations would raise up visionary leaders to find ways that promote peace and goodwill with their neighbors and sustain dignity for all within their borders. For all who order society, that our heavenly Father would guide, direct, protect them, in their various callings and duties, and for our service, women and men, especially Julie, Ken, Michael, Tanner, Andrew, Jeff, Jeff, Ryan, Kenny, Danielle, Kelly, Nick, Daniel, Megan, Joseph, Mike, Jackie, Zach, Clinton, David, Jocelyn, Stephen, Ian, Chelsea, and Jill. Let us pray to the Lord. Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For all who work the land, that God would provide bountiful harvest. And for all who manage the world's resources, that God would give them wisdom so that future generations may realize our Creator's generosity. Let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. For ourselves, that our Lord would keep us strong in faith, secure in hope, 
abounding in love. We especially pray for the pastor that we called and his family as he considers the call to be the pastor of Christ our King. Fill him with your Holy Spirit so that he may have clarity as he makes his decision. Let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. For all who are sick, lonely, anxious, or in mourning, including this day, do we remember Nancy in our prayers who fell on the ice. We pray for Robbie, R.P., Dale. We remember Kathy and Susan, Tori and Michael. We are thankful that Betty has now returned home to recover from COVID. We pray for Al. We remember Keith and Erica, Darlene, Gary, Mary, Daniel, Ken, and Grace. We also pray for Tim, Bobby, and Donna, Jane, and Dennis, Melissa. We pray for Sherry and Shannon, Danielle, Joyce. We pray for protection and comfort for those who are dealing with depression during this time of uh, social distancing. We pray for freedom from bondage for those who are struggling with addiction and all those others that we name now before you in our hearts and minds. That the Holy Spirit would visit, relieve, accompany, assure, and comfort them. And for all those who provide for healing, your healing power and presence, let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Finally, Lord, we rejoice in your gifts of people who have been true valentines in our lives, people who spoke your truth with love, people who demonstrated your love by the ways that they surrounded us with your love. Help us to reflect the one who indeed is the greatest valentine of all, your son, Jesus. For into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father in heaven, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.
Oh.